Welcome to Life in Biology. I'm Dr. Joel Graff. Um, today we're going to go over some uh, slides that were in a discussion of my in my freshman biology class, uh, Principles of Living Systems. Uh, these slides were presented on Friday, uh, the 3rd of February, 2022. And I'll jump right into it. So we're talking about semi-permeable membranes. So we set up a system designated with an outline of black and within this system we have a semi-permeable membrane which means that some things can go through the membrane and others can't. We've got two molecules set up over here in the corners. They're at high concentrations and so we're going to be expecting some diffusion to happen. The black molecules, for whatever properties they have, they are unable to make it through the membrane while the blue molecules are capable of going through the membrane. And so what we have going on here is that if we let some time go by, uh, we're going to allow diffusion and the system will eventually reach equilibrium, meaning that these dots that were originally concentrated will be spread out as much as they can be. Now, I chose black and blue for the picture and it doesn't come through very well. Um, but what you see is that if we give some time and allow diffusion to take place, uh, we've got some blue molecules on the right side of the membrane and on the left side of the membrane, and they're randomly distributed throughout. Uh, and on the left side, we have black molecules, but there aren't any black molecules. You'll just have to trust me if you can't see the coloring. Um, the black molecules all stayed on the left side, but they as well uh, randomly distributed throughout the fluid. And so that is an example of semi-permeable membranes. And again, when we're thinking about the semi-permeable membranes, we're talking, uh, we're putting it in the context of how cells have uh, phospholipid bilayers are what the membranes are to on the outer edge of a cell uh, for all cells. And then in eukaryotes, there's even more membranes throughout and we'll talk about that in a few days. But anyway, there's certain molecules such as oxygen and CO2 that can make it through the uh, membrane of cells, no problem. So diffusion can occur to allow tissues to get the oxygen they need or get rid of the carbon dioxide. Um, I'm thinking of animals when I say that. Uh, but anyway, so this, this is the type of things important, whereas there, whatever molecules here, maybe it's something like a calcium ion, isn't able to go through this membrane if the membrane uh, was a plasma membrane and has the ability to um, block uh, any uh, block charged ions because there's a hydrophobic core running through the center of this membrane. Okay, so that's the context for why we're even talking about membranes and diffusion. So then let's talk about what those membranes really are made of. And so I had just mentioned that they have a phos, um, they have a hydrophobic core, but let's see why. So cellular membranes are made of phospholipid bilayers. So phospho lets you know that we've got a phosphate group, which we remember has a negative charge to it. So that's gonna be a charged molecule. And they also have lipids, and lipids were our example of uh, macromolecules that uh, end up uh, not being uh, not not being happy to interact with water, so they try to group up and get away from water. And then they're made of bilayers, and so we'll see from the structure why they form into bilayers. Okay, so the structure of a phospholipid is that you have a phosphate group which has a negative charge, a diacylglycerol, DAG, and then uh, I, I like to think of them as capital letters with the glycerol being the backbone and the acyl chains being branches coming off of the backbone. And so with two fatty acyl groups, uh, we've got, it looks like the capital letter F. Okay. And then over here in red, we have a drawing of the, uh, diacylglyceride or gl diacylglycerol. They're used interchangeably. Glycerol is more correct. Um, we've got the polar polar group is going to end up connecting to the third carbon because the first two carbons were like on this F are have the fatty acid chain. So I have my F drawn uh, tipped over onto its front. So 
if you take a second, you can see that this looks like a capital letter F with the glycerol being the backbone and these fatty acyl groups being um, the, the cross pieces on the letter F. And so the hydroxyl group here is electronegative, and so it's going to be pulling the electrons towards it, and so there's going to be a partial positive charge on this carbon, and phosphate groups are negatively charged, and so we can get an electrons from that phosphate group can form a bond with this carbon. The electrons that were forming a bond between the carbon and the hydroxyl group are going to be taken over onto the hydroxyl, and then that floats away, and so then we've got the hydroxyl coming off. But anyway, so after that little bit of organic chemistry goes on, we have a polar group stuck onto a glycerol backbone, and it has the two fatty acids. Now, um, I drew it like the F like this, and then I've got the polar group going the other way. I'm going to show you here in a second why I have the polar group going this way instead of being like the third bar of the F to make it an E. Um, okay, so this uh, drawing all the, car all the carbons and oxygens out, and I even got lazy on those, that's a lot of work. I, I brought it down to just uh, an oval to represent glycerol and then a couple ovals to represent fatty acids and those are, um, that's, that's kind of a, a shorthand way of doing that and then I've got the polar group there. So even though I took all sorts of shortcuts when I made this drawing of a phospholipid, um, they, we can even uh, shorten it up more so that a circle with two legs coming off of it is another way that you could draw a phospholipid. We just have to understand under the hood that this circle on the top includes the glycerol plus that polar head group and that the tails are nonpolar. So there's different ways. Um, so now we've got a molecule that's polar at one end and nonpolar at the other. That's called amphipathic. And amphipathic molecules will tend to uh, organize when they're in a polar solution like water. And so how do they how do they organize? Well, if we've got water out here and water like this is the outside of the cell, for example, and then water for the inside of the cell here. Uh, we've got a phospholipid bilayer where we've got two different phospholipids working together. They've got their hydrophobic legs pointing inward so that their hydrophobic fatty acid tails can be away from the water. And then their polar head groups are okay at interacting with a polar molecule like water. And so they're on the outside. So you've got uh, kind of a sandwich where we've got phospholipid bilayer, a core, a hydrophobic core, and then or an, another phospho, phospho layer or a polar layer. Okay, so that's how it, it sh works there. Um, if, if these uh, start extending further and further, they could eventually round up on themselves to form a complete circle and this is happening in three dimensions so it's actually going to be a sphere. Um, you can get what's called a micelle. So I started drawing the, the uh, phospholipids here and then I decided to get lazy and I quit drawing them but just imagine that you had phospholipids the rest of the way around and then that would be just a 2D and remember it's going to be a 3D sphere. So we've got extra phospholipids coming out of the page and going into the page but it makes basically a bubble and the bubble is called a micelle. So uh, what is interesting now is because we've made a sphere we can now have the water on the outside and the water on the inside can have different amounts of stuff, solutes, dissolved into that water. Okay, so here is a rather busy image and we're talking about inside the cell has water. We have outside the cell has water, even though I didn't draw it. So we could have water going in and out of the cell. Now water's a polar molecule and so it's not going to be happy going through the hydrophobic core of the micelle and so it's going to bounce off. What we need is a hole in the uh, in the cell or my cell um, so that we can get water to be able to travel through. So this pore, this hole in the membrane is made of a couple proteins and this is called an aquaporin. So the specific pore that allows water to go through is called an aquaporin, which water pore. Uh, so that's pretty easy to remember.
In addition to just being called pores, you can also call them channels. Okay. Other things need channels too, like a calcium ion is going to be positively charged. It's not going to do well in this blue. The blue indicates the hydrophobic core. The black indicate on these circles indicates the uh, phospho, uh, the polar head groups on there. Um, calcium is not going to want to go through the phospholipid core because it has two plus charges on a single atom. So it's highly charged for its size and it's going to need a channel as well. Now the thing about channels is that they can be opened and closed. So sometimes the channel will be open and if there's an imbalance of calcium, diffusion will allow calcium to go in or out. Um, in this case, it's going to generally be calcium going in. And the reason for that is that in addition to having a channel for calcium, there's also a calcium pump. And so the calcium pump will require energy. So this is another type of protein structure that helps get things across the membrane. But here we're going to be taking calcium from inside the cell and putting it outside the cell. I forgot to put the two plus marks for this calcium. And anyway, so it's going to be going, if it keeps working, you're going to end up with a low concentration of calcium inside the cell and a high concentration of calcium outside the cell. That's assuming that your calcium channel is plugged. So, assuming it's plugged and that you keep taking the calcium from inside the cell and pumping it out, now we're getting to lots of calcium molecules on the outside of the cell versus inside. So, if the calcium channel ever does open, we have a quite a concentration gradient to work with. Uh, sometimes the calcium concentration outside a cell can be 10,000 times more concentrated than the calcium inside the cell. So if we call inside the cell 1x calcium concentration, these brackets are shorthand for concentration, then it could be 10,000 times that concentrated outside the cell. So you can imagine when these, when these pumps open, calcium will flood into the cell. And so that's a, one way that the cells can rapidly respond if they need to is it's a, this whole flow of calcium from outside the cell to inside the cell is called calcium flux. Over here, we've got a glucose transporter. So again, we're gonna have uh, this time, glu glucose is a little bit polar because it has some hydroxyl groups, but it's gonna not want to be able to go through the membrane both because it's a little bit larger and because it's a little bit polar. So it's an example of something that you need to have uh, a channel, a pump, uh, a transporter to get it inside the cell. So for glucose it's called a transporter and that will get the glucose from outside the cell to inside the cell. Okay, um, I'm not going around this circle apparently in the exact same way that I drew it because here I'm just indicating a phospholipid bilayer and let's see what do we have going up here. So if a molecule is polar then oh it's polar is these black arrows going to the black line here and the black line here hydrophobic is the blue line so that's when I was trying to explain my color coding for this and then finally there are some small molecules that are nonpolar for example CO2 so CO2 can go from outside the cell to inside the cell or from inside the cell to outside of the cell it can do that by diffusion and it passes right through the bilayer and it can move based on any concentration gradients. Okay, so we talked about a Nobel Prize winning experiment. In this experiment, we had diffusion, where you go from a high concentration to low concentration. But if we talk about diffusion of water, specifically water being going down a concentration gradient, it's called osmosis. But just like the other type of diffusion, it goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. Now remember, water is going to be a solvent. So when we think about um, water and its solutes, um, if we have high concentration of solutes inside of a cell and then low concentrations outside of the cell, then that would tell us that the concentration of water inside the cell was low because the high solute concentration was taking up space and so just by the fact that there's only a finite amount of room within the cell, the water concentration is to be lower, which means that outside the cell, it would be a high concentration of water. In this case, we're talking about a frog egg, and this is, I'm describing the Nobel Prize winning experiment. And in this frog egg, these, if you think about it, they need to be these eggs that have a, 
a little tadpole growing inside of them or embryo tadpole growing inside of them and that they're going to have lots of stuff inside the cell and they're going to be sitting in a lake that has ver uh, fresh water and that's going to be a very low concentrations of uh, solutes outside of the cell so the frog egg has low water concentration inside and high water concentration outside now the the uh, cells uh, do not have many aquaporins in it, if any. Um, but here I'm drawing as if it does have an aquaporin. And if that happens, water would run into the cell. So let's talk about the experiment. These cells have a naturally very low level of uh, aquaporin uh, in their surface. Uh, maybe it's even zero, I can't remember. But um, if we put a bunch of eggs in water uh, and you do, don't do anything to those eggs, 100% of the eggs should be stable over time. However, if we add DNA into the cell and the DNA gets transcribed and translated into the aquaporin protein so that now we've got lots of aquaporin on the cell, then we're going to set up a situation where the high concentration of water outside the cell, the low concentration of water inside the cell will cause a flood of water into those cells. And because it's just a phospholipid bilayer, it's held together not even with covalent bonds. And at some point, the pressure inside this uh, frog egg would get so high that the frog egg would burst. Okay, so that's what this blue line is. These are cells where they put in DNA that ex makes the aquaporin, and so that over time the cells would swell and we they get to the point where they burst so there's we start out with 100 percent of the uh, eggs being stable and before long all of the eggs will that are making those aquaporins will burst and so then we go down to zero so yeah they injected dna into an egg and a protein called aquaporin was made so that was this that's the experiment about the discovery of aquaporin and it's a very important molecule uh, to have in your cell membrane. But that brings up the idea of tonicity. So let's just take that idea of these frog eggs having a high concentration of solute inside the cell. Um, and, uh, and, and then a low concentration outside. That would be considered hypotonic. They have a low concentration of solutes outside, so fresh water. So I'm drawing six different figures here. Go ahead and pause the, the video and, and, and draw these out. But um, how this works is in the first case is exactly what we just saw with the frog egg. Because there is high concentration of solutes inside relative to outside, it means there's a low concentration of water inside relative to outside. So if we have aquaporins, you're going to have more water flowing into the cell than water exiting the cell. And it's hard to read this writing right now, but this was an arrow pointing in, a big arrow pointing in and a small arrow pointing out. And so the overall uh, effect is that water is going to go in. And it's going to swell to begin with. And as water goes in, now you're starting to get closer to having equal levels of water inside and outside. But at some point, if too much water goes in, the cell will burst. In our second example, rather than hypotonic, uh, an, an, a cell sitting in uh, a solution with low concentration of solute, we have a, a cell sitting in solute where the concentration of solute outside and inside is roughly equivalent. And in that case, you've got water that can go, flow out and water that can flow in because diffusion is kind of a random process. It means that the flow, the arrow size are the same, the flow in and out of the cell is the same, and so then the pressure within the cell doesn't change. And finally, if we have a cell where uh, we are in a hypertonic solution, the water will end up going out of the cell to try to dilute the liquid outside and allow the solutes to become more concentrated. So in this case, the cell would shrink and it'll shrink down to the point where uh, those solutes inside the cell get concentrated until they're equal with outside. And if this is an extreme enough scenario, the cells could die from this uh, shrink, uh, shrinking activity.
Okay, the bottom row, the top row was all animal cells or uh, like the frog egg. The bottom cell or the bottom row of cells are plant cells. So I stuck with red to indicate the plasma membrane, but I switched to blue to indicate that there is a cell wall around uh, each plant cell. Within this plant cell is a water vacuole, and in the water vacuole there's uh, solutes that are in there, and outside of the cell there's going to be water, um, and there's going to be concentrations of solutes inside and outside the cell. So if the plant cell is in hypotonic so uh, solution that is the concentration of water is high outside the cell and low inside of the cell it means that you'll have an overall uh, uh, in uh, water will overall go into the cell uh, but unlike the animal cell that would swell and maybe burst the plant cell can only swell so far because it has a, a plant a cell wall. So this is like putting air in a basketball where the cell wall will is like the basketball cover and it won't won't um, won't expand past a certain amount. I mean you could really overdo it and eventually blow up a basketball but for the most part it's a nicely inflated basketball. Or if we wanted to use a scientific word it would be turgid. T-U-R-G-I-D. Meanwhile uh, the plant cell where there's equal uh, solute inside as outside the cell, meaning the amount of water concentration inside and outside is also equal. You're going to have the equal flow of water into and out of that water vacuole and into and out of the cell. And in all, you're going to have the cell, uh, if it started out kind of limp, it's going to stay limp. If, you, if the cell started out uh, turgid, it'll stay turgid. Uh, it'll stay at whatever pressure it was. Meanwhile, in the final example where it's hypertonic, you have a high concentration of salt outside the cell, which makes the con relative concentration of water low. Then that makes the water inside the cell high. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to have an overall net movement of water out of the cell rather than into the cell. And a plant cell will uh, shrink or become less pressurized. And so that's kind of like a basketball that's been deflated a bit. And so the word for that is flaccid. So over here we had turgid for being high pressure and so then your plant doesn't look like it needs watered. Once your plant starts drooping, it's because it doesn't have enough water, so you're gonna uh, throw in, uh, it's going to start shrinking down. Okay, that was in a really long extended discussion of hypertonic and hypotonic, but I just wanna go over that real carefully because it's so easy to, when you hear hypo, hypo means low, you just have to remember that's talking about the solutes. And since the water is the solvent, if the, wa if the solutes are low outside of the cell, the water is high outside of the cell. And you have to think about the, what the water is when you're thinking about the net flow based on diffusion or based on, in our case, the word is osmosis. Okay, well, that was a long rambling discussion. I uh, hope you got something out of it. And I will stop streaming now. Okay, this has been Life in Biology. Like and subscribe or not.